Everyone my age is terrified of becoming their parents. We can have interests our parents didn't, travel to places they've never been, considered ideas they've never fathomed. But even with all these new stimuli, there's some part of your upbringing that will seep into your psyche early on and only make itself visible at the times when you least expect it. And even if you try to fight it, it will find its way in. My mom was a truly unmatched human being. I never met anyone who didn't like her, and she loved everyone. Beyond making friends wherever she went, she loved her family so very much and did everything in her power to help them out, even sacrificing some of her own dreams in the process. For example, my mom used to live in Las Vegas for work. While I was visiting her when I was 23, a friend of mine invited me to go out clubbing last minute. I told my mom I needed a dress for the club. And she dropped everything to make sure I had something that was, in her words, hot but dignified. <laughs> my dad is both hilarious and the smartest person I know, and he simply loves being a dad. On Easter when I was four years old, my six-foot hulking father dressed up as the Easter Bunny and brought me a golden retriever puppy. Similar to my mom, my dad would do anything for his family. Anything. <laughs> If you're getting Tony Soprano vibes from my dad, you're on the right track. But he's not in the mafia, I swear. He's in waste management. The thing with my dad is that you do not mess with him. My dad once told me that if anyone crossed our family, they're fucked until they die, and when they die, their kids are fucked. <laughs> But when you're young, no matter how bubbly or cool or intimidating your parents are, you have no choice but to be embarrassed of them. At 11 years old, I cared so much about what other people thought of me, and my parents didn't care at all. I was dead set on fitting in. My whole personality was just silently blending into the scenery and hoping no one would notice. I was not a girl, and so, so, so far from being a woman. I was making a cru crucial decision in my life where I'm wondering if I should become emo or just give up on it all. <laughs> Spoiler, I chose to become emo. <laughs> but not before trying on loads of different personalities in an attempt to fit in. At my very white Catholic school, everyone was blonde. My hair is not remotely close to blonde. Again, my mom came in clutch and tried to help me out. She used sun in on my hair. Yeah, that is correct. <laughs> I don't have any pictures from that era because I burned them all. But I looked like that special aunt you have who's had m as many husbands as she's had cigarettes. <laughs> I told my dad that the kids were making fun of me for my two-toned hair, and he said, if they've got something to say, they can say it to my face. <laughs> I was so afraid of upsetting the status quo, of presenting an opinion that wasn't popular. All I wanted to do was forge a personality that was so different than my parents. They were unafraid of standing out, of being loud, and of being unabashedly themselves. When you're 11, all of that is very uncool. And I was terrified of being uncool. I just wanted to cry, write poetry, and maybe play Lilith Fair, despite not being able to play any instruments and it having been over for several years already. <laughs> my parents even owned a bar called Patty's Inn, which means they're well-versed in the art of making drinks of making friends, and making sure that guy who did too much coke doesn't die. <laughs> what I'm saying is that they're extremely great to have at parties. <laughs> Consequently, they were very popular when I was growing up, much to my chagrin. Nevertheless, since my parents were cool, I went to a lot of parties with them as a kid, and we lived in Reno, Nevada, which means the parties were fun, but a little backwoods. Reno is a nice place to grow up, but it's got its quirks. It's a mix of glitzy Las Vegas, monotonous suburbia, and backcountry values. Reno is like if Carnival Cruise docked in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> We're all having fun, but as soon as we leave, we start to realize how fucking weird that was. <laughs> One of the parties that's most memorable to me is a party of my mom's coworker, Linda. My mom worked at Southwest Airlines at the time, and the people who work for Southwest are the exact type of quirky you'd think for a low-cost airline that serves children snacks on the plane. They're lighthearted, they're not pretentious, and you could let all your baggage hang out for free. <laughs> During the party, I was hanging out with the other kids. Being 11, you're thrown in with both toddlers and teenagers, and no one is having any of it. 
The toddlers wanted their parents, the teenagers wanted alcohol, and I just wanted to disappear into the 70s chic wood paneled walls. But finally, two hours into the party, things very quickly got full backcountry when Linda asked, does anyone want to see my prairie dog? <laughs> this was not a euphemism. <laughs> this seemed like a fun prospect to me. I have never seen a prairie dog up close before, and my only acquaintances at this party could barely walk for different reasons. A prairie dog would make this party interesting to me. I love dogs. I love Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> This seemed like a perfect match. My dad immediately shot this down. It's gonna bite somebody and then I'm gonna kill it, he yelled. <laughs> Nervous laughter filled the room. Oh, he won't bite, Linda said. Before you could say howdy, the prairie dog was out of his cage in the center of the party. The toddlers were running toward it. The drunk adults were yelling at it, but I was intrigued. An, an acquaintance that would end my boredom without me having to speak at all this prairie dog and I were going to get along great. Linda asked me, Sam, do you want to hold him? I immediately nodded. Simultaneously, my dad put down his vodka. I hold the prairie dog, and for a moment, I am one with the prairie and its puppies. <laughs> we are mother and son. We are Madonna and child. And just like any successful mama and baby relationship, he latched into my thumb hard. <laughs> He dug his teeth so far into my finger that I swear for a moment I was part prairie dog, part girl, and still no part woman. <laughs> I began to lightly shake my hand, hoping to remove him without having to say a word, but it wasn't working. I finally dropped all hopes of being invisible, of being polite, of being unobtrusive, of being cool. I looked horrified at Linda and then at my parents. Get him off me! <laughs> I started waving my arms back and forth as my dad rushed through the toddlers, the drunk teens, the flabbergasted adults. I waved my arm with the prairie dog still attached like he thought if, I la if he latched tight enough, I'd take him back to the wild <laughs> where he belonged. <laughs> my dad finally reached me and removed the prairie dog from my person before my dad could do anything else to the prairie dog. Linda stepped in and retrieved him. He never does that, so weird. <laughs> my mom, Seeing the fury in my dad's eyes build, but ever the perfect party guest and friend said, oh, well, it's been very fun, but I think we'll be leaving now and you should put that thing away. <laughs> my mom collect collected us and we made the silent drive home. We never talked about it again. It just became a part of family history. And at that age, I hope it would stay that way. In my teens and 20s, I did so much to separate myself from my family. I didn't listen to them. I was the only one of my parents' kids to move away from Reno. I went to liberal arts school. I can't take shots. I like light beer, and I've been known to drink a White Claw from time to time, which when you're the daughter of bar owners is all very disgraceful. <laughs> I love my parents dearly, but I wanted to be my own person, have my own experiences, show that I could leave the nest and not carry any baggage with me. But no matter how much I tried to outrun them, there they were. None of that was clearer to me than when my husband and I traveled to Malibu for the first time. It was a year after my mom had died, and since she loved the beach, we were going there to honor her memory. We had planned a picnic complete with all of the drinks she would have loved. However, since we had never traveled to Malibu from LA before, we had no idea how bad the traffic would be or how we would spend two hours in a left turn lane to go into the beach parking lot. Two hours. With each green light, one or two lucky cars would make it into the lot before it would turn red again. My husband and I sat hot and annoyed, waiting for it to be our turn as the ice in our cooler melted and the picture of my mom in my hands became pooled with my own sweat. As we sat in the line of cars and slowly inched up to the front, the light turned red. A straight off the lot, green Range Rover with windows open, two girls in their 20s was in the lane next to us. They began to inch toward us, making their intentions clear that they were wishing to merge in front of us to bypass the obligatory two hour wait time, to assert themselves as better than us, to virtually spit in our face, disrespect my mother and my family, and move in front of us in line. The mantra I was raised with echoed in my brain. If you fuck with my family, you're fucked until you die, and then your kids are fucked. Without any hesitation or consultation, I rolled down my window and yelled to their open window, we've been waiting for two hours in this line! Wait your fucking turn! Fuck off! 
Thank you. I, I rolled my window back up and the women in the car sped forward in the lane going straight, missing the parking lot. At that moment, I realized that I would do anything for my family. I love to party in weird ass situations and I was finally a woman. I clutched the photo of my mom. I had fully become her, my dad, and my history and that was fine. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>